Hello and welcome to Inbold, the podcast brought to you by Strategy Ends Middle East team, where we dive into the most important topics impacting the Middle East and the world. My name is Karim Dawood, and this is my colleague and friend Karim Serkis from Strategy End in Dubai. So in the second series of Inbold, we're looking to lift the curtain on the media industry, global trends, and how they apply to us here in the Middle East. We'll be inviting over the next couple of episodes guests who will share their experience and enlighten us with their perspective of where the industry is going. So sit back and enjoy as we dive in. Welcome everyone to our Experience Center here in Dubai. Today, we're sitting with Nick Grande, CEO of Channel Sculptor and founder of Mina TV. Thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate being invited and having the opportunity to talk with two people I respect enormously in this space. And I hope that we can fix a couple of things along the way and you know, have some good ideas on the industry. So yeah, my background, I've been in the TV industry for 30 years now, and 22 of those years were in the Middle East. You know, I started here with Showtime in 99, and I set my own business up in 2008. Originally, I guess it was at a time when TV channels were all the rage. I just launched MTV Arabia with Viacom and Dubai Holdings, and I was being approached by lots of people to launch TV channels. I think, I don't know whether you're involved in that report where the booze did back when Showtime was almost IPOing, and mm -hmm. there were time 140 TV channels, and everyone said it's unsustainable. And by the time I launched Channel Sculptor, they were already close to a, uh, sort of 800, and they went over 1,000. So I kind of rode that wave to start with and was working with all these broadcasters. And then, of course, you know, things started to consolidate. There was lots of telcos, and I changed my business accordingly. I realized that the telcos needed to have relationships with these many TV channels. And so as a result, we ended up sort of providing that, that gateway. So we were working with Do and with Saudi Telecom and with Vodafone and Orange and various companies. But nowadays, we, actually, how do I put it? Around 2016, I could see that uh, Linear was no longer quite as hot and the broadcasters themselves were really starting to worry about revenue streams and so I initially started looking at this as revenue opportunity for them if they looked at their libraries and how they could monetize them and so we built this marketplace initially to help particularly the free-to-air big Arab free-to-air broadcasters to monetize their libraries mm -hmm. but of course quickly you realized there's a whole market here mm -hmm. attractive to the producers whether they're in South America in Asia in Europe obviously like in Africa all wanting access to MENA buyers, and not only the broadcast, but all these new streaming platforms that were coming up. And so has become for us as a business, the, it's a labor of love. We're still working out how to make it work. I've learned through the process that it's not a simple thing to connect buyers and sellers in the TV world. But yeah, that's the journey we're on. And finally, I suppose it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that we love transparency. We love audience data. And we've managed through our partnership with eVision to bring audience data to the region, to passive measurements, so literally measuring the activity on boxes to help broadcasters and the industry understand what's going on without any intervention. And so we're about a year and a half into that relationship now. And, you know, it's amazing. We've got like 5 million viewers, you know, 1.3 million households that we're looking at the daily data for. And you've got broadcasters like Disney, like Warner Discovery, like using the data, also free-to-air people like DMI, Sharjah TV, Roya TV in Jordan, lots of different uh, broadcasters finding new use cases for this data. And so I think for me as a business, I've realized we're probably never going to be the huge super tanker, you know, a stars play type of business or, you know, you look what media have done in the B2B space. But what we can do and what we do do is create a lot of transparency for the industry and hopefully create more liquidity at the same time. Thank you very much. And, and from what you're describing, you do sit in the middle of this very interesting triangle. I mean, you have the consumers who we know are actually evolving a lot in their consumption patterns here in the region as, you know, from a global trends perspective. Mm. Then you have the industry players, the platforms, initially broadcasters, but increasingly moving to digital platforms. 
And then you work very closely. I mean, you're also with the creators, the people who create the content. Exactly. And I love what you mentioned about the, the currency, you know, the data, the transparency that allows the whole ecosystem to make better decisions. So mm. I think we're in for a very interesting discussion and debate because, again, you sitting in the middle of this, having started at a stage when the industry were somewhere and where 10 or 15 years later, it evolved so rapidly, be able to share with us uh, tremendous insights. So perhaps start with what is happening globally. Yes, uh, the, mm. this year, 2021, 22, waking up away from the pandemic, a revival of the whole entertainment and media industry. All reports show a phenomenal rebound in 2022. And then some internal studies we've made at Strategy and PwC show as well, this is meant to continue at a very healthy growth rate to 2026, reach a three trillion industry, this whole entertainment and media. So mm. this is globally. What is your take on what is happening from a global events perspective, shaping the media globally? Well, it's really interesting to hear those numbers, Karim. And uh, I'm sure Mr. KS over here will have something to say on this one as well. I mean, I, what is intriguing to me is seeing how the industry globally is waking up to the need for profitability. Mm. And so you mentioned this growth prospect. And obviously within that, there's a trend towards more advertising supported content. You know, Netflix being a prime example and even bringing businesses like Microsoft into the TV content space to work with them, which is very exciting, I think, because, you know, what that might mean for the way advertising is measured, mm. you know, because for such a long time, globally, advertising has been controlled by Meta and by Google in large part. And, you know, having another multi-trillion dollar entity in the mix and one which has a different perspective, working with a business like Netflix, which is so, how do I put it? I really admire the way the Netflix management team have built that business. It's been a very organic process. They're extremely surgical in the way they run their operations. And so the fact that they're, admittedly, it looked like a knee-jerk reaction when they made that move, but it feels now more and more like it could work. I was initially quite skeptical, I must admit, because you know, Microsoft has a LinkedIn ad business, but it's microscopic compared with these other guys. So, mm. but going back to this point about profitability, if you look at what's happened with the Disney stock price, you know, and then currently, obviously, Bob Iger coming back in, what that means for the business, this potentially this recognition that they can't go completely hell for leather into to D2C. They need, to, I, I mean, mm. I don't know how this guy is going to adjust the plan, but clearly, Profitability is on the shareholder's mind. Yes. And these are all private entities. Post-merger, what does it mean for Warner Brothers Discovery in terms of HBO Max, for mm -hmm. example? I think we're all expecting HBO Max to launch regionally as part of its international rollout next mm -hmm. year. I think it's now fair to say that could be years away, you know? And this is part of this, I think, this realization that just acquiring subscribers without consideration of bottom line is no longer tenable. Nick, I want to pick up on some of the points you mentioned and sort of zoom out a little bit into the global, the global trends that these examples that you're giving are basically representing. I think we can all agree that one constant so far has been in the media industry that although it's changing drastically, the increase in consumption from a need for more media and different types of media has been a constant. We had COVID was a blip, if you like, now in hindsight. Back then, uh, maybe we had different forecasts and people weren't sure, mm. but we've come out stronger. So... To me, the demand for content, because the con consumption is increasing, is only getting stronger and stronger. And that's something that's really driving a lot of the growth of the ecosystem. Mm. You mentioned the shift to profitability. Yes, what markets are expecting from OTT players is changing, and it's uh, leading to people like uh, Warner uh, being more focused on the bottom line. It's leading to Netflix launching an ad-funded business and so on. But the globalization of OTT continues, right? and, and that from sitting where we are sitting, that's a good thing because it also means that local content is becoming more and more not only relevant to the global players, but also opening up markets for it beyond, beyond its immediate, uh, immediate markets. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple more and then I'd love to hear your, uh, your yeah, reactions I mean, I, to I them. I must admit, I'm just thinking about what you're saying, I don't know whether I can even, because there were so many points packed into that. But I think the key question I would ask from a regional perspective, whether I was in any region, is how do we feel about the global market being controlled by this oligopoly? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for us, you know, with our 
whether we're in Latin America or in Asia or whatever, for our homegrown streaming and like to what extent are we going to see the producers just trying to get into the good books of Amazon, of Netflix and so forth and bypassing and what does that mean for the industry? Because I mean YouTube is providing a model here, you know, YouTube is a global platform which is basically taking content producers from all over the planet and putting them into their space. And, you know, I was having a chat at a trade show yesterday with a platform which is an, a streaming platform in their words, but they're entirely on YouTube. And, uh, Why is it a bad thing if YouTube takes MENA creators, gives them a platform to, me, to access well, the, MENA consumers? If you're lucky, and you know, they only take 55% of your revenue. That's the problem. Yeah? So, like, you know, they're controlling... But, they, they, you might as well go back to the bad old days of industry. Look, look I'm, again, I'm being controversial with YouTube, but uh, I think that when one entity controls the delivery, controls the ad wrapping, controls the rev share, literally controls how much airspace you have, is that good? You know, what happens if you have another Twitter situation? You know, like, is YouTube under Google a, a United Nations entity? You know, it's, no, it's a company, it's a business. And they are there to beat the competition, just like every other business. So I would say precisely because it's a company, precisely because it's a business, that's actually what we need in the Middle East. I think one thing we've been suffering from is that we haven't been treating this sector as a business. We've been treating it as a, we'll come on to as a sort of subsidized, subsidized industry. And as a result, we've been sitting on our backsides for a very long time. Absolutely. And the but one thing that has shaken the status quo is these global players coming into the region, scaring the heck out of everybody. Governments are worried they're going to lose access to their consumers. The local players are worried they're going to lose their audiences. Everybody's worried they're going to lose their advertising revenue. What better way to get everybody innovating than to have some real competition in the room? I think we'll be talking about the region in a minute, Karim. So like, <laughs> I think at a global level, I question whether this is good. That's is my point. Is it good that you have an oligopoly controlling how and what is getting produced? Is it better if you can have more regionalized? And look, MENA is a special case in point, and we can, I think there's a lot of reasons why it's good to have somebody like setting the bar. I absolutely mm. agree. Whether it's somebody like YouTube or somebody like NBC Studios even, you know, w within the regional players. Okay, let's agree on, do we agree that the creator economy is a, the rise of a creator economy where individuals can have direct access to audiences and maybe they're not all making massive yeah, amounts yeah. of money, but at least there be some, a, a few of them are building business. And even those few are actually many more than the production companies that were able to survive yeah. in creating professional content in the previous ecosystem. Um, can we agree on that? I, we can, and I'm being deliberately mean. But in truth, you, you know, without YouTube, we've never would have had Basim Yusuf. Like there are Precisely. some great creators that have come out of, and having that large ecosystem, having the audience being able to be in one place is great. It's just. It's a shame in my mind that it can't be more like satellite in the sense that they control the delivery, but they don't also control the measurement, the rev sharing, all the other pieces. Mm. That's the, if there was some way globally there was a bit more of a sharing of responsibility between entities and there was some kind of independent measurement. You know, people are very critical of audience measurement in region, but I would point to the fact that if you look at... Again, I feel like I'm Facebook and Google bashing, but it's the truth. Like, if you look at Facebook and Google, both of them control their entire ecosystem, you know, every part of it. So you have to agree to their rules to play in their world. And if all the great producers are coming up through that ecosystem, that just, they're Nick, benefiting Nick, from that. Nick, let me challenge that a bit. How is this different from the old system where basically three or four executives in three or four media companies decided what goes on air. You're talking about MENA now, yeah? No, even, even, before, even before in the US. So that's where media started. It started for gatekeepers who basically controlled what everybody saw. How is that any different? Since we the 1980s, you've had people metering globally. I mean, out of the 50 biggest economies on the planet, there are only five that don't have people metering. Yeah, but the, the measurement aspect... Three of which are in the region. Aspect, <laughs> the measurement aspect of it, I agree, that's a... But it's really important. But that comes after the content is decided. So to me, being in a scenario where rather than four executives at four dominant traditional, quote unquote, media companies controlled what people were allowed to see, and then we measured that. We didn't measure the totality of content out there. We measured what the viewership of content that these four executives, effectively in any given market, were decided you were going to see. Mm. Now we're in a scenario where, yes, maybe we don't have 
we have multiple measurement ecosystems and it's a big issue, but this is where advertisers and things like IAB and things like pressure on uh, standards comes into play and that we let the market uh, has to play a part in that as well as government. But we are in a scenario where actually have multiple paths to the consumer. You have multiple paths for different types of content to reach them. So I see this as an improvement, not as a step backwards. It's actually really interesting listening to you because I agree with your points in many respects. But I think at the same time, I'd liken it to what's happening in the music industry. So once upon a time as a band, you needed to find an A&R person who believed in you to get you signed. But once you were signed, you've got the whole backing of a label and your CDs were being sold for you know, $15 a piece and you'd rapidly have ma marketing machine behind you, you'd have the big tours and so forth. I think the consumer was a net beneficiary because what that meant was there was serious work going into records at scale, I mean in volume. So you had a number of artists, some of whom would fail, but they would still spend six, nine months in the recording studio working on a record that would get released. If you look at the situation now, yes, it's much more democratised. So you've, you know, it's much easier to get an audience on Spotify. But typically that will be for a song rather than for a record. And it's only an elite few who are in a position to actually control the market. And if you look at what Taylor Swift has done recently, for example, breaking the internet with her content, concert sales. But like, for the vast majority, we're in the age of the one-hit wonder now. And they're completely commoditized. And I think that that's kind of the world you're describing. So I agree, if you want to make a great record single in your bedroom, you're much more likely to have a hit now than you ever used to be. And in the same way, you can make a wonderful show on YouTube and potentially grab an audience, even if it's something that has an incredible niche appeal. I think it's good. I think it's bad. I think it's both. I agree with you, but then I, it frustrates me that you've got one entity controlling everything or two entities. And is it if, isn't this a classic case of we have a certain situation, then you have the major technology platform disrupting or they're shaking up a status quo that was not at the end sustainable or very beneficial. And then perhaps out of this, and we can talk of it in the third leg of this uh, conversation, mm. something new will emerge, right? Because it will have been forced to, to change. And then this equilibrium of not just a, a tech control oligopoly, but hopefully local platform players who are very much from the region and almost perhaps reflect the identity of the region, as opposed to those global tech giants that have a global commercial agenda. So perhaps something good can emerge of this transition period. Yeah, I think in. the identity thing, you could argue quite strongly that global pl platforms can actually help in that area because if they're investing well, mm. then it means that content producers, whether it's Netflix or YouTube or whatever, can get an audience more easily in region as well yes. so, and uh, get more investment and there's more transparency. So there's, I don't think they're necessarily a bad thing th in that respect. I think my concern is more about it being so few. So back to my point so about few. Microsoft, mm. I think it's good that there are more companies like Apple, like Microsoft, you know, whoever else, Samsung, getting into the game to create a situation where pe perhaps there's a greater need for regulation and some kind of cooperation way. And it's, it's, at the moment, it's almost an accepted. People don't question the measures they get from these companies. It's just, that's just the currency. That's what it is. But yes. when you've got TikTok and you've got Snapchat and whoever else all taking their share of the attention economy, all looking at content, maybe that will lead to innovation on the measurement and on the monetization. And I think there is definitely scope in region for more entrepreneurs to be controlling some of the pie here as well, in, in this region as an example. Can you, if we think of the global trends that we've been discussing, increase in consumption, meaning I need more content. Globalization of OTT, meaning also I need, it's getting more competitive, but I also need more local content because that's how the OTT guys are getting into, into markets and that's how the local markets are reacting to them. If we're saying ad advertising funded models are still valid, but they're switching to digital, and this is where Nick's point comes in and says yeah, they're switching to digital where actually they're being concentrated in fewer players. Yes, there is a challenge, absolutely, but at the same time for our part of the world, given that most of consumers are not used to paying for content, the fact that we can still continue to offer them content supported by ads is a, is a plus. The, the trends in, in terms that are happening globally are also applicable to us regionally. The impact of it is differs. I think there's a negative impact on our, if you like, top layer 
of the ecosystem, our broadcasters, our media companies, the ones who need to survive, need to own audiences and need to monetize those audiences. That's where pressure is actually the highest. I think it's a positive at the middle layer of the content creator side, whether it's the professional content creator who now has more clients that they can produce for, or whether it's the influencer or the digital creator who is monetizing a smaller niche audience through a short-form content. It's the, it's the same trend, but it's playing out differently at different layers of the ecosystem, don't you think? Yeah, I agree and disagree. I mean, I think that the producers, in theory the winds of change are good for them. And I think everybody has a feeling now, I think, that, I mean, speaking as someone who's worked in the Arab world now for over 20 years, like, I think there's never been a more positive feeling about the ability to export Arabic content internationally. I think within the regional market, there simply isn't enough money at the moment. But uh, my concern would be that there aren't yet enough credible buyers in the market and so to your point about the big players suffering you know those are the commissioners and so with the exception of a, a couple of extremely well-funded well, government-backed entities there aren't enough serious buyers but I do think that's changing I think there's an impatience amongst the producers they look and say where's the demand but I think that is, that is coming there's more and more people businesses stepping into the space, especially with the rise of AVOD, advertising supported TV. I mean, we're going down to the regional level, but I think that we should that's think globally right. about advertising and, mm -hmm. and what that's, what's going on there as well. But, yeah. yeah, I think with, for producers, when global players entered the market, it also, it's a bit even, it's even, even before OTT and so on, it's also a little bit similar to when, you know, in previous phases we had Turkish content becoming very popular or before that Mexican content or mm -hmm. Latin American content. It, every, every bit of wave of new content coming to consumers and becoming a preferred genre or a preferred st or a new standard of what consumers expect has then led to, consequently, the local content stepping up raising yeah. the bar to trying to match what consumers, you know, they lose consumers to the new shiny thing, what Turkish, now it happens to be global OTT uh, series and so on. And then the local players react and then they up the bar and then they commission. And we've been seeing this, right, so, you know, before, I think a few years ago, four or five years ago, talking about $400,000 an episode of a spend by a local player would have been inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Whereas now that's very quickly becoming something that is expected and the norm, at least for the producers that are that these themselves at the top of their game. So, yes, I agree, I agree that there's pressure on the commissioners, but at the same time, from a consumer and an industry perspective, it's actually raising the level of quality and increasing uh, the... I think, uh, I, think I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's, it's about consumer demand in the end. And, you know, I see this at the, again at the, the trade shows. I was talking to one of the big distributors from the UK yesterday at the trade show, and uh, she was saying how nobody will touch a show that's older than 2018. Nobody's interested. It has to be fresh. And I think that is testament to the level of increase in investment per episode that we're seeing. And, you know, there was Netflix entering the market for production was a watershed moment for MENA. Mm -hmm. but, and I, I look, the other thing is that this is happening all over the world. This is not unique to MENA. I mean, we're kind of zeroing on Amina, but, but yeah, the, that moment when they started spending three, four hundred thousand dollars a net was a huge sea change. So that the idea that you could produce a show in 30 episodes and start writing three months beforehand and, you know, film it in a villa and spend 20,000 an episode. I mean, you just can't do that anymore. It, mm -hmm. Nobody's going to buy. So... Yeah, it's completely changed things. So I would just like to come back to something you said about the demand and the need for the region to create content, but also export it because mm. the region is not good enough. Here is a, a very recent uh, statistic from a report measuring the digital spend uh, here in MENA. At 4.5 billion, one, one could say this is actually sizable, but then when you compare with other European countries, this would make the whole of MENA smaller than Italy, that is at 5 billion. Mm. Now we know that even before the digital era there where the whole advertising shifted there even in traditional tv the whole ad spend per capita was depressingly low here yeah. now do you see this changing uh, with the advent of digital yes i do i think it's there there are so many things to consider within that on the positive side digital really presents very 
strong opportunity to measure that hasn't previously existed, which mm. gives everybody confidence. And equally, digital means there's no longer such a thing as MENA, which again is essential. We have to get away from this idea of thinking that Algeria and uh, Iraq are the same. In one, one interesting facet about our MENA, MENA industry is, unlike other set m markets, you know, if you look at global trends and global headlines, they're talking about court cutting, about loss of revenue from pay TV, from cable, and so on, which we didn't even, we never got to that phase. Right? We never got to that phase because we went, you know, in, in the Middle East, we have a tendency to leapfrog the other m markets because of the pace of technology. So satellite, we were behind, very far behind. We were localized markets. Uh, we had uh, government-controlled media industries, very few number of channels and outlets. Satellite came along. We had a big revolution, so, but then, which was good in the sense of all this whole media industry and the hundreds of channels were created. And then that spurred on demand for uh, lots of production companies and so on. The bad thing of it is we never got to a robust model of monetizing media. We never had consumers pay for content. And we had this free to air, and Nick mentioned the hundreds of thousands of channels. Those channels, uh, uh, well, what percentage do you think of the thousand channels that existed when you launched? when you were launching with Viacom were actually profitable. We, we don't really have this. It's not like, I, if I yeah. look around Mina today, I can't name five, uh, yeah. five privately owned large media companies that have a balance sheet that is robust enough to fight off global competition. I can't find them. I can find, if, if you broaden the definition and start saying government backed, indirectly government funded, we start finding them. So we're coming to this point where, yes, we have more competition, but rather than seeing it as a negative because it's eroding the wonderful ecosystem that we had, the ecosystem we had was never financially viable for most 99% mm -hmm. of players. So now we're getting to a point, I think where we're getting is, the pressures are still the same on the, on the broadcasters and the media o companies, and they may or may not make it, I don't know. Yeah. But the second layer has an opportunity, exactly like you said, it's not about Mina, any, it's not content, you know, content is gonna travel. Content is going to be paid for on a higher level per episode than ever before, and this will only increase. Now, is this a great solution for everybody? No. But is it better than where we were before? I think so. Well, yeah. Like the, going back to your point about the, the number of channels, yeah, I think it peaked at about 1,200 free-to-air channels. Yes. Uh, you just basically filled up these seven west and 26 east positions. And some of those channels were literally just many of those channels are just slates, or they were purely about religion, or they're purely about a news agenda that's or a particular... Or just an SMS yeah. generating machine yeah, for a while. <laughs> but, uh, and I think what's interesting actually is that, uh, well, let's look at the context of that. Like, there's a lot of dumb money, you know? But let's be honest. There's an awful lot of money that is just being spent to, you know, how many people back in sort of 2000 and seven just wanted to have a TV channel. It wasn't about anything more than literally, I want a TV channel. I want a boat, I want a TV channel. I want a plane, you know. What's interesting now in the world of digital is that actually it's a lot cheaper to do this. So, and if you look at what's happening, you know, I'm getting sort of hit by emails from people like Vimeo and so forth to launch my OTT platform tomorrow. And this is me personal, you know, like launch my gym, lessons TV platform or whatever happens you to be. You personally? Yeah, I, I think obviously look at me and they think, you know, he's a very healthy guy. <laughs> very good. It's much, much easier to, from a technical point of view, you don't need $350,000 a year to, to buy a satellite slot. You don't need to have a full play out kit and so forth. You mm. can literally ha outsource all the platform side to some business elsewhere and then concentrate on the shows and the shows themselves, you can even insource that. So. Of course, what people forget is that actually, even when I was working at Showtime, about 20% of our revenue was spent on marketing. Mm. And we were sort of shaving profitability at the time. So what that meant was we were probably spending about 30, 35 million dollars on, on marketing, something like that. Mm. I don't think many of these AVOD or startup businesses have thought about that aspect that it's harder now because there are so many more players doing this. So even if you move out of YouTube into your own platform, you've really got to gain mind share in a big way. And so that's a very good point, Nick. And I think we've passed the stage where just because I'm streaming, I'm ahead of the game. Right? That mm. streaming is table stakes now. You know, one thing that I find a bit funny when I look at the talk around Fast, uh, for example. Yeah. 
for some people, it, sound, it seems like it's a great new innovation. Oh, we have streaming channels that are as advertiser funded that can be thematic. That's just taking what cable uh, channels were or F our FTA channels in the Middle East were on satellite and putting it on streaming. Just because I turn a failing FTA channel into a thematic fast channel doesn't well, automatically mean I'm, I've cracked the business model. It's actually right? worse than that because you might have a successful satellite TV channel but you could easily lose your audience if you push it into a purely digital delivery situation. You probably still need that satellite position if you want to maintain your audience. Because, you know, one of the things that you'll often hear, because it's true, is most people of the 500 or whatever what it is, how million people in this region, watch satellite TV. Most people do not stream. Even in a mature market like the UK, like... If you look at, they've now started publishing, the reason it's interesting is Barber now start publishing like-for-like -like numbers for streamers alongside Linear. And guess what? Squid Games was a really big show, but it wasn't, it was, I think it was number 10 in the top 10 at its peak. Yeah? That's fine. That's great because it's a subscription product. I mean, free TV is still, in this market, a whale compared with everything else. It's so much bigger. And NBC channels like NBC One, NBC Two are genuinely eating a huge proportion of the audience. And there are other, other networks that, you know, Abu Dhabi, with its, you know, particularly with its sports programming, has done really well. During Ramadan, they didn't, I mean, we see the numbers. These networks do pick up big audiences. But if you take a middle tier broadcaster uh, who does have an audience and you stick them on a fast service, that means that somebody's going to have to find on their Roku box. So if you take your ex existing, moderately successful, maybe you're not profitable, but you, have, you know you've got an audience, you know, even from your social media response, you know you've got an audience. If you take that and stick it into Fast as an effort to boost your ad revenues, you might find that the fact that you are somewhere downstream within that ecosystem of a Roku box means you're losing your audience entirely and your ad, ad revenues are with it. I think the most aggressive players I've seen so far in faster companies like Euronews, and they really are sort of ahead of the curve in this. But I look at their numbers and across the platforms and I realize that it's still, it's not sufficient to fund a, a business this fast. But it's un interesting, but my question is this. As a consumer, what it's asking me to do is to ditch my uh, satellite TV box and replace it with a streaming box. M will I then go back to linear? Having made that transition into uh, the world of digital, whether it's through my smart TV or whatever, will I do that or will I go and start looking at Wayak and looking at Shahid and looking at uh, Viewclip and uh, you know, YouTube and so forth and never even get to those linear channels? That's the thing that I keep thinking when I hear people. I feel like Fast is such a sort of a salvation for linear broadcasters, but it predicates itself on the fact that we believe that consumers really want linear. And Netflix experimented with this in France. I haven't seen, I don't know if anyone knows the results of that, creating linear channels. This idea that you, you don't want to always have to figure out what to watch. Intuitively, I don't know whether I believe it. I don't know. I think one thing that we have to always remind ourselves as people in the media is we tend to get carried away with our own headlines I mean, and then versus looking at the data of what consumers are actually doing. Even in developed markets, linear still takes up a considerable amount of viewing time. Yep. Even more so in, in the Middle East. What's shifted is the business model behind it. And in the Middle East, it's even worse because the business model behind it wasn't great to begin with. And where the advertisers and the options that the advertisers have in terms of where they allocate their money. But I like a lot the point you were making earlier. Today, if I'm MENA, one, there isn't such a thing necessarily. I really have to look at the context of which, who is my audience? Because there are some market, you know, if we look at broadband penetration rates, they can vary as much as, you know, 40, between 60 to 95 percent, depending on what markets you're looking at. If we look at the speed of broadband, if we look at mobile broadband penetration, mm. it's not the same. The purchasing power of consumers is not the same. You cannot sell, you cannot come into MENA and suddenly ask people to pay for content and expect all people to be able to afford it. And so this hybrid approach to the markets and understanding who your audience is really has to influence your solution approach. give you a concrete example of that. Abu Dhabi Media looked at killing off their kids' channel at the end of October and they put out an announcement about it and there was an absolute uproar from Instagram and social media feeds where they put it. 
And if you looked at what was being said, a lot of it was, look, I don't have the broadband to watch a digital version of things. Why are you assuming that, you know, I mm. want my channel. We love this channel. It's safe. We want it for our kids. And the, uh, we've seen this through the eLife data. We could see that Majid was a phenomenal channel. And so it was quite perplexing when that, that shift to digital looked like it was going to happen. Thankfully, they changed the decision and, uh, you know, Magic Kids is there. But it, that reaction from the audience, the fact they were given the opportunity to respond was very valuable. And, you know, it's easy from the ivory tower of Dubai or wherever to, to forget that actually you have an audience of, as a broadcasting industry, you have an audience of whatever it is, 30 million people in Algeria or, how, you know, like these are, Iraq's a big market, NBC are trying to sort of, to, and each of these markets needs different things. They are different evolutions in terms of broadband, in terms of consumer behaviours. It does benefit from piracy, of course. I mean, uh, most set-top boxes are being sold with a dongle and they're getting everything for nothing or more or, more or less nothing. So that, I think, probably helps this kind of concept of connected TV at some level. This brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for a brilliant chat, Nick and Karim. And thanks to you, our listeners, for joining us here today. This was the Strategy Ends in Bold podcast. See you next time.